Father, Father, any questions? What are we covering today? Train signs. So, let me just finish the other ones. Orange. You should bring oranges to throw at us instead of candy. I should what? You should bring oranges to throw at us instead of candy. All right, charms time and theory. Well, this is um, something that happens in plus one dimensions. At least that's what we're going to talk about. Something analogous may happen in other dimensions, but uh, I'm only going to talk about two plus one. So let's suppose this might be some underlying theory, L0, and then we add to it a term like this, gamma, epsilon mu lambda, why we're using Greek letters, especially since we're only in three dimensions, I don't know. I've seen it with ABC. Good. <laughs> I mean, that class just looked at the though. I'm following uh, Z treatment, and for some reason, he has a fondness with Greek letters. Um, let's consider a gauge transformation. A mu goes to A mu plus D mu lambda. So what happens to this um, the churn Simon's term is this thing. So are we restricting the this A field to be abelian or non-abelian? We're abelian in the for, for now. Okay. However, I worked out the non-abelian case, uh, the non-abelian theory, and I'll do that at the end of the hour. Unfortunately, Z didn't do the non-abelian. He just said one can do the non-abelian, so I had to work it out myself. All right, what happens to the churn Simon term? Under a gauge transformation, sorry, I'm slipping from one this goes to epsilon mu nu lambda a mu plus d mu lambda d mu a lambda plus d lambda lambda and you see the problem with using too many Greek letters um, now this is the original term plus a term that's slightly different and then two other terms So these are the other two terms that occur. Now, these other two terms are identically zero. The reason is that this is symmetric in mu and nu, mu and lambda, and this is anti-symmetric in mu and lambda. Is there still a d nu in that term? So isn't everything multiplied by d nu though? It's d mu lambda d lambda lambda. So where is the d nu, which everything should be multiplied by, right? D it's in the middle there. Oh yes, that d nu. Hey, you're right. I left that out. I mean, that shouldn't change the symmetry of under mu and lambda, right? Obviously not. All right, well, well, then that's all right, I don't know what I was doing when I did this. This is that. There's also a.
Okay, there are so damn many terms here. Let me try to get this straight again. So the first term from that, the first term is this one. The next term is that one. And then the one with two lambdas, you're right, has an extra d nu in it. D nu, d lambda lambda. And then this one, this one's okay. All right, but um, it's still, it's even more Symmetric row than it was before. <laughs> yeah. Because you've got well, you've got anti you've got symmetry in all the indices here and anti-symmetry in all the indices here. So the thing is zero. And over here you have symmetry on new lambda, anti-symmetry on new lambda, so this one's also zero. Right. So the effect is it's it's just these two terms. I think the only symmetric part is new and lambda there, right? Because one's the first derivative and one's the second derivative. So what does it mean for like mu and nu? No, you're right. It's not symmetric. All right, just just mu lambda. Just that. Yeah. Okay. But when there's no nu, it's symmetric in mu lambda. Yeah. All right. Anyway, it's zero. So there's just this extra term. On the other hand, on the other hand, so this is. Epsilon mu nu um, lambda a mu d nu a lambda, which is the original term. And now we can rewrite this by um, putting the derivative like this. In other words, we can write it as epsilon mu nu lambda d nu of lambda d nu, well, it's a little angstrom. Because the term, the extra term that we include is a d mu d nu a lambda, and that's symmetric. symmetric on mu nu, yeah. so that's zero. So it's the same as this. This is a total derivative. And so it doesn't affect the field equations. We can integrate it to a surface term. And then we sort of get out the rug. Out the rug. Anyway, it's just a total derivative. So delta S is a surface term. Delta L is a total derivative. Now let's look at it. So what you mean there is that since this is the Lagrange density, we're going to put it into the action and integrate over all space time. Right. And then we can use like a, a Stokes theorem kind of thing to replace this total derivative by a surface term. A surface term. And then okay. And then there's some physical thing that'll say this should vanish at infinity or something like that. Like or equivalently, uh, basically, it's that because it's a surface term, it doesn't affect the field equations. All right. Now, it turns out that this churn simons term is is rather well, cute. It's d cubed x epsilon mu nu lambda a mu d nu a lambda. Well, this is equal to a mu d x mu. So the whole point of this was that this didn't change the um, action. Like gauge transformation didn't change the action at all, right? Right. It brought from a surface term. Right. And by the way, in supersymmetry, the supersymmetry transformation changes the Lagrange density by a total derivative. Okay. Um, okay, so this is a mu dx mu. D 
k lambda dx lambda. And carrying through this exterior differentiation, we get a mu dx mu um, d nu a lambda dx nu dx lambda. And so the d, the, the, the differentials provide the EPS, the anti-symmetrizing symbol. So in other words, the churn simons action, you can think of it as S is an integral over some manifold A, D, D, written form language. So strictly speaking, that's A wedge D, A? Yeah. Okay. If you want, well, I don't, I mean, I don't know. If you want to put in wedges, yes. But I mean, Yes, and as I in Finley's notation, it's a wedge. Okay. It's a wedge. Just tell me in Finley, Finley land, and I, I will know. Okay. Now, let's just assume the Lagrange density is gamma. Epsilon mu nu lambda, a mu d nu a lambda plus a mu g nu. So what are Lagrange's equations? Well, it's d nu partial L, partial d nu a lambda, partial L, partial a lambda. OK, the derivative with respect to that is just um, d nu of gamma epsilon, oops, epsilon mu nu lambda. Uh, a mu, and on the right hand side we get j mu, well j lambda, plus um, gamma epsilon lambda nu sigma d nu a sigma, and we can rewrite this as j lambda plus gamma epsilon lambda nu sigma a lambda nu mu, d nu a mu, and then we rewrite that again as j lambda minus gamma epsilon mu nu lambda um, d nu a mu, and now we move this over to the other side. And what we get is we just uh, we just exchanged indices there. Mm -hmm. Okay. You move you the lambda through yeah. and you switch mu. So you get two gamma epsilon mu nu lambda d nu and mu is j lambda. Or if you want. Epsilon mu nu lambda d nu a lambda is minus j nu. So now let's um, take the divergence with respect to mu. And this gives us 2 gamma epsilon mu nu lambda d mu d nu a lambda is minus. d mu j mu, but this is identically zero, so the current is conserved. And of course, so, so in, the, in this theory the current's conserved, and in fact because the current is conserved, this, under a gauge transformation, this term which we hadn't looked at, this goes to a mu plus d mu lambda times j mu, and now um, that's a total derivative. The change is a total derivative because you can write d mu lambda j mu as d mu of lambda j mu uh, minus lambda d mu j mu, and this is zero as what we just found. 
And then, so that's a total, so the other term also changes by a total derivative. There's also the, just the um, matter field in L0. Yeah, whatever this is, you can assume that it's um, Asian variant. Here, I forgot to give you, uh, I owe you at least one. Yeah, you assume that L0 is here. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, <clears throat> suppose the particles at rest, so Ji is equal to zero for I equals one to two, <clears throat> integral over the space of d1 a2 minus d2 a1. This is the curl of a. Um, this is going to be uh, over here by using this equation. This is equal to minus 1 over 2 gamma integral e2x j0. So this means that this particle has magnetic flux. This is effectively the magnetic flux right here. In other words, it's the integral d2x of b. So we call this phi, and so phi is equal to that. Um, now, there's a tricky thing here. If you move one of these particles around the other, it gets a phase, e to the i integral a mu dx mu. What does it mean for the particle to have flux? Is that the same saying it has a magnetic charge? Um, it means that this J0 to say here. Let's just say that you integrate the current over the area and what you get is a certain amount of um, flux. Of course this A could be zero in which case mm -hmm. there isn't any flux. But it somehow has let's just say it has all right, now, if you move one particle around another, you have a phase e to the, this integral here, which is e to the i, d2x, and again, you have d1a2 minus d2a1, and this gives us e to the minus i over 2 gamma, d2x, j0. And um, this. So this is telling me about uh, transporting one particle around another. That's sort of yeah. That's what's being said. But the the fact is that this is 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 rather tricky here. Um, this turns out to be. You see, here I'm getting 1 over 2 gamma. The phase turns out to be e to the i theta, e to the i 1 over 4 gamma. So there's an extra factor of 2 that I don't really understand. It's a tricky 
factor of two here. And um, in as much as it's not altogether clear as to what one means by moving one around the other, let's just accept it as theta being one over four gamma. All right, the next thing one can do is go back to this Lagrange density and think about integrating out the, uh, the gauge field. And so what, what, we, what we look at here is we look at this as a um, as a, a path integral here, dA, and this action here, I'm going to write as minus a half aka is, is, is this part. And if one does do that, then k is equal to minus 2 gamma epsilon mu nu lambda d nu. So it's k mu lambda here. So looking at this and ignoring the difference between raising and lowering indices for the moment. So we're doing this because we want to, we want to use our tricks for Gaussian integrals that we have from before? That's right. <clears throat> so that thing's going to be up. Okay, so if we say that is S, um, then that's K, and what we have here, this is minus a half A mu, K mu lambda, A lambda, but there's another term, which is J mu, A mu, and then by this fundamental path integral, this is E to the one half J, well, little J, J, K inverse J. And um, so what's K inverse? Well, K inverse lambda sigma is 1 over 2 gamma epsilon lambda nu sigma d nu over d squared. Are you using the Euclidean space or Euclidean action? I think that the modulo a change of sign, this works in either case, but yeah, think about it as Euclidean. Okay, yeah. Understand? Now let's see why this this particular thing is true. Let us take k mu lambda times k inverse lambda sigma. then this is minus epsilon mu nu lambda. I seem to have left, uh, lost factors of two. Because um, k, we said, was a minus two gamma. So there's a minus two gamma from k. And then k inverse is 1 over 2 gamma. And this is epsilon lambda rho sigma d rho 1 over d squared. So that's, that's the product of the k times k inverse. And of course, we get a cancellation of the two gammas, which I guess is why I left them out in this expression here. Okay, so what is this? This has two epsilon symbols and we use our famous identity and so this is minus delta delta minus delta delta 
d nu d rho over d squared, and this is uh, mu nu. This should definitely be the event, right? Whoops. And then we have uh, nu sigma. Rho sigma. Okay. So this is the expression. And this gives us minus d sigma d mu minus delta sigma mu d squared all times 1 over d squared. Okay. But this thing is sitting between Two conserved currents. Why isn't k times k inverse just one? I'm trying to show you that it's one. Okay. This k inverse is sitting between two conserved currents here. And um, so because the currents are conserved, this term we can forget about. And altogether, what we get is just delta sigma mu. Why should it depend on if it's sitting between two currents? Because otherwise I don't know how to get rid of that. <laughs> well, but I mean the operator k, k inverse, just we shouldn't need to leverage the fact that the, the field, the matter field, is there, right? Um. Actually, it's something else that I forgot to say, namely that uh, we're 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 doing this in uh, a gauge d mu a mu equal to zero, so we have that vanishing as well as the current. That may be how one uh, avoids this term. Um, actually, when I was working it out, and I got to this point, I said, ah, the currents are conserved, bingo, so that we get to this. If there's something more subtle going on, well... Uh, all right, so what is this pentagonal then, e to the s? It's going to be e to the 1 over 4 gamma j mu, and then k inverse, and that's Epsilon mu nu d nu over d squared. Got some factors for that. Mu nu lambda. Okay, so that's that's what happens then when you integrate out the Chern Simons field. Assuming that this is the k inverse. And uh, this thing is called the Hopf term. And Why? I don't know. <laughs> so. Is there a question? How do we do? Oh, okay. We have cameras up there. Never mind. Yeah, and it 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 sort of works, but um, yeah. As I say, this this it should work. In, in a more careful way of doing it, you have to take advantage of the gauge condition and the conservation of the current. Um, all right. Let's look back at this uh, action. This action, which is gamma integral over, over some manifold epsilon mu nu lambda a mu b nu a lambda b cubed x. If we write it in terms of forms, it's gamma integral over m a d a, where d is the external exterior derivative. Now remember the thing that's really magical about forms which I mentioned, but maybe didn't emphasize enough, is that a form is intrinsically invariant. So A 
this a mu dx mu, if you make a coordinate transformation, the dx's change, the a's change, they change in such a way that the change cancels. So this is the same thing as a prime mu dx prime mu. Okay. The same thing with the exterior derivative and so forth. So this action is invariant under general coordinate transformations. So it's it's invariant under general coordinate transformations, but it doesn't have a genu nu in it. Whereas normally in relativity, you get something that's invariant in the general coordinate transformations, but the price you pay is you put in a metric and you put in various connections and so forth and everything. You've got all those shock absorbers so that the thing is invariant in the general coordinate transformations. In this case, the, just by the structure of the forms, it's invariant. So this thing is called a topological field theory. This integral over a closed manifold depends only on the topology of the manifold and not upon any metric that we might put on it. Okay, now I'm going to do the non-abelian case. Let me get some chalk. Exterior derivative plus the plus the one form of the gauge field. That's really a common hmm? It's really a common right? No. Isn't that what ends up happening? Well, all right. It, it, it may it, it, because actually, you know, the answer to that question about the commutator is probably just that the uh, the anti-symmetry built into the forms makes the thing into a commutator. But in any event. This is our covariant derivative. So, how does it transform? D prime is equal to GD, G inverse, where G is the gauge transformation matrix. Now, in this case, this D and this D are active, that is to say they're, they're differentiating anything to the right. So um, let's consider the following action. S is gamma integral of the manifold trace of df, where f, f is da plus a squared. Form. And this, this is, of course, non abelian, that's why I have a trace there. So this is equal to gamma integral over the manifold trace d plus a da plus a squared. Actually, let me immediately say the reason why I write it this way is to show that it's gauge invariant. Because under a gauge transformation, this thing goes to gamma integral over m trace d prime f prime. But that's gamma integral of the manifold trace of g d g inverse g f g inverse. And these cancel because of the trace. You can move the g around so that G integral over M trace D F G inverse G, which is gamma integral over the manifold trace D F. 
So this is this thing is is gauge invariant. Now let's look at what this thing is. Well, when D comes shooting across here, it hits this. In other words, this is gamma integral over m trace of d squared a. Well, that is what? Zero. Right. Plus d a squared plus a d a plus a q. So that's what this thing is. Um, so this one, as you pointed out, is zero. And uh, so now we have to examine this one. What is this? Well, this is one I think that we encountered before. But let me just do it again. And I'm going to use Roman indices so as to um, not have so much trouble. So let aj comma i equal di aj. So then trace of da squared is trace of di dxi aj dxj ak dxk. So that's what we're talking about here. And we can rewrite that as trace of this derivative can hit this one or that one. And so we get aj comma i ak plus aj ak comma i times dxi dxk dxk. And you can imagine wedges in there. I don't need that parenthesis. The dx's don't need to be inside the trace. OK, well, let's look at this. This is, first of all, aj, comma, i, ak, dxi, dxj, dxk, plus aj, AK comma I DX wedge DXJ wedge DXK. Okay. Now I'm going to write this as ditto. And then over here, I'm going to interchange K and J. So this is going to be K, J comma I, DXI, DXK, DXJ. These are dummy indices, so they don't care what we call them. The next thing, though, is we use the fact that the trace of AK, AJ comma I is the same as the trace of AJ comma I, AK. And so this is then trace of aj comma i ak times dxi dxj dxk plus dxi dxk dxj and so this is what I'm looking at which is zero because you can Zero because this is minus that. Okay, so this expression here, this one is also zero, and so this this um, non-abelian churn simons action then is gamma integral trace over whatever the manifold is. The first two terms are gone. And what we have is ADA 
plus a cubed, which is the same thing as gamma integral trace of a times f. Because f is dA a squared. The reason I didn't write this down immediately is that the gauge invariance of this is not obvious. But if you go over here, the gauge invariance is obvious. All right, so that's the non-abelian term assignment. Now, Now, I'm going to start quantum hole forward, but um, I must say this is well, it starts out very simply. Well, first of all, what is the, the Hall effect? The Hall effect, of course, is if you have a magnetic field pointing out, and you have a current J going this way, then um, you have V cross B as a force on it, and so the current goes um, off to the right. That's the ordinary Hall effect, and so what you do is you have a uh, a um, strip here B field pointing out, current flows down, and you find that you, you've got um, a higher voltage here than there. Okay. Um, so now let's consider, let's consider instead of electrons, let's just think of spinless electrons for simplicity. Bx minus IE AX squared plus dy minus i e a y squared psi equals 2m e psi. So this, if you divide by 2m, you see this is p squared over 2m. Notice this is px because the mechanical momentum, mv, is the, is the canonical momentum d by dx minus e times the gauge field. All right, and um, Landau looked at this. I don't know if he was the first to do this, but very possibly. Um, in, it's effectively something in two plus one dimensions because you've got the electrons in some area and the B field perpendicular. So B is B times C hand. And um, if you solve this problem, you find out that the energy levels are EM is equal to M plus a half EB over M. And they're quantized, of course, N equals 0, 1, 2, and so forth. So um, this is the energy level of what's called the nth Landau level. and um, it's degenerate, and uh, you can ask, well, how many electrons can you stick in there? The answer is that the degeneracy is E times B times the area divided by H, Planck's constant, and in natural units, H is 2 pi, because H is 2 pi H bar, and H bar is 1, and so this is Sorry, Kevin, I, this is a stupid question, but where is the degeneracy? Because of the direction of the magnetic field? No, no, it's just that you've got so many different, in other words, how many states do you have there? So, first of all, and, and, and all, the end, all the electrons in the nth level have this energy. Oh, oh, oh. And, you can, and if you have an area A, you can put in this many of them. So, presumably there's a sum on that equation above, right? Because here it looks like it's just the equation for a single electron. Yeah, it's a single electron, and this is the 
Okay, so you get down to here, it's just one spinless electron, which has no degeneracy. Um, right, because there's no uh, plus or minus in the... Actually, I didn't, I didn't work out the solution to this. I just copied down the uh, answer. It would seem so that, like, yeah, like if we have, like, if the system... Well, there's only one quantum number. I, yeah. give, I give it to you, N. So how could there be any degeneracy, right? Yeah, Unless you include spin or something in the weight in the Hamiltonian. Right, spin or if we're talking about more than one spinless electron. All right, you. Although there may be one. One quantum number. I don't know what the effects of the. Let me, I mean, I didn't write down the details of this. Let me just, let me look at what Z said. All right, hold on here. No, 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 no. What I said was right. Each Landau level has this degeneracy. And I think Z um, was a little sloppy with its factors of E. And, um, I think one needs an E here. He doesn't have the E, but one needs it. So this is for the, so this is the degeneracy. In fact, for um, well, of course, it's is A the area? Actually, I'm sorry. You guys are right. This is the filling A is the area, and the yeah. point is that you can have. One electron going around here, another right. one going around, another one going around there, and you have enough area to can fill it. This is the filling fraction, or so one over the filling fraction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in other words, you were right. There's no degeneracy in the single problem, but when you have an area, you can put many electrons mm -hmm. down. All right. So, okay. Now, but the important thing is that when you change n, you have a delta e which is uh, E B over M. So in other words, you can, you can, uh, you can add electrons, or oh, let's put it differently. You can shrink the area, and that's fine as long as you don't um, force the, uh, the, the you don't force them to go into a higher level, higher Landau level. So you can have them all in the zero Landau level, and then if you squeeze a bit, you're going to have some of them go into the first level. Does this have to do with the? I mean, I've read that the quantum Hall state is incompressible. That's right. Is that the same so state? It's in, yeah, it's incompressible when. All right, let's look at the filling factor. The filling factor nu is the number of electrons divided by the degeneracy, which is EBA over 2 pi. So when this is an integer, the field, the, the fluid's incompressible. But when, um, when it's not an integer, then uh, then it's okay, and you don't get forced into an extra, um, land, into a higher land up. All right, now, if you have an electric field in EY, you have a current in the x direction, which is sigma xy EY, and this sigma xy turns out to be nu e squared over 2 pi, which is e squared n e over 2 pi e v a, and then 2 pi here, and this is all together e over n e divided by v a. Does the, uh, so the incompressibility doesn't have anything to do with the fact that they're fermions and some sort of Pauli exclusion thing? Um, yes, it must because um, it does have to do with that, absolutely, because after all, the degeneracy wouldn't be BA over something. 
uh, unless you had, uh, yeah, I mean, you could put them all in the same place that they were both. <laughs> right. Okay. Now, it turns out that if you're, that this thing here, if you plot sigma xy against magnetic field, it has these plateaus which are due to impurities, but we're going to take up impurities later. All right, now, so this, so far we've been talking about what's called the integer Hall effect. There's also a fractional Hall effect. And this is when the filling fraction is 1 over 2n plus 1. In other words, a third, a fifth, and so forth. Now, what's the number of flux quanta? Well, the number of flux quanta is EBA over 2 pi. And so the number of flux quanta divided by the number of electrons is EBA over 2 pi times 2 pi over EBA nu. And that's just 1 over nu. And so that's 2n plus 1 when we have this magic magic number. But the magic number is that when the filling fraction is, uh, is a third, a fifth, a seventh, the fluid is again incompressible. All right, now why is that? Well, the idea here is that there seems to be basically an odd number of flux tubes or flux quanta associated with each electron. So if you have an electron here, let's suppose 1 over nu is 3. And we have three flux quanta here. And now we have an E minus over here. And we're going to move this E minus to here. And there's, there's a pi. How do I know that, I mean, this fraction tells me like the number of flux quanta per electron, right? How do I know that they're localized in this kind of way? Oh, good question. This is a hand-waving argument. Uh, but do you, do you have any idea? No. Okay. But I uh, All right, so you move it like that. What's the phase? Well, first of all, there's an e to the i pi because they're both fermions. And then there's a IQ P over 2. It's over 2 because we're just doing pi. This, in other words, what is this phase? This phase is, uh, this, this Q, of course, is E. So I can write this as E. This thing is the integral E A mu B X mu. Okay, that's the extra phase. Remember that's, that's the term in the action. So this phase is E integral A phi say D phi, and we're going here zero to pi. So from zero to pi. The first one is the fermionic one. So isn't that an exchange? This, yeah. That's an exchange, right? Yeah. So from the rest frame of this guy over here, doesn't that look like this goes all the way around? No. No, it's, it's you rotate this guy by pi, and then you translate. Okay. And um, so what is this? This thing then is, it's a line integral of A around. So this is E uh, A. B um, over two, and I'm sorry. E B uh, A. This A is area. Sorry, area. And so this is flux E flux over two. So that's what this is. And that comes from the flux tubes or the fluxes. Right. And these and and what is phi? Well, this is minus one from the first term, 
then e to the i, e over 2, phi. And what is phi? Well, there are 2n plus 1 elementary fluxes, and each flux is 2 pi over e. That's the elementary flux thing. And so what we have then is minus 1 e to the i pi 2n plus 1. So this is then plus 1. So when the filling fraction is 1 over 3, 1 over 5, 1 over 7, etc. The um, electrons effectively are turned into bosons in this group check any on point. And so, so they can be described, A, they can, so they can condense, and also they can just be described by a scalar field. And um, so it's, yeah, it's it not the electrons that condense, but the electrons and these fluxes together, right? It's these like weird composite things. Because the electrons obviously can't condense on their own. Well, they can, con they can condense with the, f I don't know, they can condense with the flux tubes. Yes, but it's like here, here's the trouble. You see, when I when I thing, uh, when I first worked out the phase, I took the the Wilczek viewpoint that you're trying to push, which is that whole thing is which is to say that this was a composite particle. But if you do that, then you've got three guys here, and when you go around, but that's only going to change. You get a factor of two in the phase, and that means it. Um, uh, you, they always stay fermions if this is 2 n plus 1. Yeah. Wouldn't that make it, okay, yeah, 4 n In other words, you get, you get the phase from this guy going around the flux tubes, yeah, yeah, but these flux good. tubes move around this guy, so you get another phase, you get it twice. So I think the right way of thinking about it is the behavior of the electrons amongst the flux tubes is such that the electrons can Dense, or at least can be described as a scale. Well, here particle. we've only done half of a cycle. You mean pi? Yeah. We always do that. You do pi and then translate. Anyway, these guys. Kievelson, Hansen, and Zahn. Well, my point with that was that if you did a whole thing, wouldn't you just get twice that anyways? Right, but that's not what you do to, to interchange the particle. You rotate one about the other by pi and then translate. We're just looking at exchanges, okay. All right. So what these guys did is they wrote down a Lagrangian, an effective action, effective Lagrangian density. I d0 minus I d a0, notice it's nominal logistic, plus 1 over 2m psi dagger pi minus i e a i squared psi plus some v of psi dagger psi. Okay. So they wrote this down and proceeded in a in uh, proceeded to work out the fractional quantum ball effect. Um, the approach taken by Z and Wen, which is a little more waving of the arms, but um, much shorter, <laughs> goes as follows. So let's see, where can I find some dark blackboard? I think maybe down there. I'm going to go down there. So basically the idea is to remember over there 
what happened was we saw that that the charged particles were associated with magnetic flux. Um, and that magnetic flux can change the statistics by that 1 over 4 gamma phase that I talked about over there. So the idea is to use a, an effective field theory that has a Chern-Simons term in it. So L is some L0 plus gamma epsilon i j k a i d j k plus h a j k. So now we've got an effective field theory for these electrons in this plane. And uh, we can get a phase change of 1 over 4 gamma. So the, it's a, the effective field theory of a whole fluid then is, in this view, a Chern-Simons theory. And this is based on five um, hypotheses or five statements that are fairly plausible. First of all, it's a 2 plus 1 D system. Uh, so can I ask the... Uh whether or not it's incompressible is going to be determined by gamma now? Um, yeah, I think, well, yeah, I think that's right. Okay. Okay, let's go to two. Secondly, the um, charges are conserved. Well, that's pretty plausible. We can deal with an effective local action. What, is, what does that mean? Ah, good point. That, in fact, is the weakest of these assertions. So who asked the question? All right, you get a candy. Do, do I owe you a candy? You want a candy? Probably, but I'm good. Mm -hmm. but what, what does it mean? It's I can understand. Okay. Um, local grounding. Local means that we've got fields like that. If you had something like this, this might not be local. Okay. okay. Four. We have the Chern Simons term though. You just pointed to the what did you point to? Right. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But 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 this is this is a non-local. This, this Lagrangian is, is non-local, right? Because we've integrated out the thing that made it local. Okay. Let's go. Let, let, let me. Oh, we have the same term here, though. All right. Let's let's let's. let's go. All right. Now, let's focus on long distance effects. Doesn't that go against the previous thing? What? Long distance versus local? Not well, no, no, no. It could be local, so you know, long distance field theory. Theory. And remember when I did the Thank continuum, I'm sorry, continuum. did the renormalization group for condensed matter? I had that if you had a field that was of the form G, a term Lagrangian was the form some field A, it doesn't need to be a gauge field, raised to the nth power, then the beta function for that coupling constant was D minus N over 2, D minus 2. And so the higher n, the lower beta, and beta is how the, the, how the coupling constant varies with distance. In other words, gn of L is L over L0 to the beta of gn times gn of L0. This is the idea. And 
in my online textbook, there's a section on that. But in that section, I did just the case, I just did this case. What I have to do is I have to add another paragraph for when this is derivative in here. And um, when I applied that to confinement, I got away with, I, I focused on space rather than space, rather than time. And so the time, I was able to know the time. Okay, so that means we want small n. And effectively, this means that the, in four dimensions, uh, a scalar field or a gauge field has dimensions of mass. And so this term has dimensions of mass to the n. So we want the lowest mass term, mass dimension. If you have derivatives, each of the derivatives brings in a mass dimension. So this condition is a like renormalizability condition? No, it's not renormalizability. It's that the terms that have the lowest dimension will have the biggest effect on long distance properties. And then finally, um, a B field breaks P and T and parity and time reversal. And the idea here is you've got a B field and um, so the current is going in a particular way through the solenoid and so um, that violates time reversal and you can think of it also as violating parity. And the reason why we're talking about the, why we're looking at something that violates parity and time reversal is that that's what the uh, churn Simons term does and um, yeah, you can see that it breaks parity because if this is a vector field, this flips, that flips, so does the derivative. So that's three minus signs. Uh, breaks time reversal because one of these is a time derivative. And if you have a single time derivative in there, that screws up time, time reversal. All right, I think we've gone far enough. Um, I'll um, plug in my arms and start waving some more on Wednesday and we'll get through this, uh, the rest of this. So why don't you stop the thing now? Um,